Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at a Soviet D-30 122mm gun. This is actually an interesting piece in that it was intended to be both a howitzer, which is to say an indirect firing gun, set up as it is right now, but also be capable of direct fire anti-tank rolls, uh, having to barrel at a much lower direct firing elevation. So this particular gun is owned by Battlefield Vegas, a rental range in Vegas, where they will be setting this up to shoot for people like you who show up uh, down there and are interested in it. But today we're out at the range to do a little bit of inaugural test fire on it, and I figured it'd be a really cool opportunity to show it to you guys. So there are a number of interesting things about this that make it frankly a little different than a lot of other artillery, and different than a lot of other Russian artillery as well. First off, you can see we have these two trails here, and there's a third one running straight out in front. The wheels are lifted up and out of contact with the ground. And the idea here is that this piece can be rotated 360 degrees and fire in any direction, where a typical artillery piece, the wheels remain in contact with the ground, and you have two split trails that come out from the back. That tends to be faster and easier to set up. You can see how much goes into the, the setup of this. It's not an easy or quick process. Uh, however, that limits the ability of the gun to traverse. Um, there are a few other considerations that you have to take when you're going to do a system like that. The trails have to be a little bit longer because they are spread farther apart, so to ensure that the gun is properly stabilized. And of course you see the two big red spikes holding these down in the ground. Those are instead of having little scoops on the end of the trails. Now this is a uh, semi-automatic gun, which in the context of an artillery piece like this means that uh, when it fires, the whole action will cycle backward under recoil, and it will automatically spit out the empty cartridge case. Uh, the gun will then return to battery, but the breech stays open, ready for the gunners to load a new cartridge into place. So speaking of the cartridge, we have the components for one right here, and this is how the gun was actually used. The ammunition didn't come pre-assembled as a self-contained cartridge like we might think of it. Instead, this is more of what's called a bag gun, where you have a projectile, and you'll load the projectile, you'll then load your powder charge in a case which acts as an obturator. So the purpose of this is to seal the back end of the gun when it fires. Uh, this is 122 millimeter, which is kind of standard, the uh, you know, the Soviet equivalent of the US 120. Uh, this is a 19.1 kilogram, or about a 40 pound projectile. Uh, and they had both armor piercing and high explosive, high explosive anti-tank, uh, HEAT, a wide variety of shells for this because of its design as a multi-role gun. So I don't think the skull on the trigger handle is original to the gun, but we do have pretty much all the rest of the controls over here. We have the hand wheel for traverse, hand wheel for elevation, and we have our sighting systems, both an indirect sight and a direct fire sight. This of course is the direct fire sight, and this is basically a whole bunch of math uh, in physical incarnation that makes up your indirect fire sight. This was introduced into the Soviet military in 1963, and it actually remains in service in a lot of places worldwide to this very day. Uh, these were widely exported and used around the world, so you'll find them in places like, uh, well they served in the Iran-Iraq War, um, they've served in Africa, they've served all over the place. In terms of construction and design, this is actually kind of more like a German gun than it is a Soviet one. It's more complex than most Soviet artillery of this period and of this type. So if we look inside here, we can see a couple of the design elements. We've got the uh, gear and sprocket right over there for actually cranking the barrel up and down. That's assisted by a single pneumatic cylinder on the opposite side to give you a little bit of an assist, well a lot of assist, in raising this thing. Obviously barrels on something like this are relatively heavy. The wheels are going to pivot up and down so that they can go down uh, for transport when all three legs come pivoting back here to match with this one. Then the wheels go down and you can tow the gun uh, for firing. Uh, actually, for firing, you start by putting down a central pad, which you can see uh, on the ground flat here. You use that pad to lift pressure off the wheels. You then lift the wheels up, split the three legs out, and then you're ready to put the gun into service. 
Now, located up here above the barrel is a two-part recoil system. You have one cylinder full of oil, and that's going to restrict how fast the barrel recoils backward. And then you have a second cylinder full of compressed air or nitrogen, ought to be nitrogen, uh, which will push the barrel, the whole breech assembly, back into battery after it ejects the empty case. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and lower the barrel down a little bit and fire this thing. Is it in tight? Yeah, it felt like it went in there pretty good. Okay. We'll know when you put the, pro or the case in behind it. Well, thank you guys for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. It's always really quite an experience to get out here and uh, be able to be around something like this firing. Definitely not, not your run-of-the-mill sort of activity. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this particular gun belongs to Battlefield Vegas. If you're interested in doing something like this yourself, definitely check them out. Thanks for watching.